Hi everybody, welcome to the first lecture in plant physiology. And in this one we'll be looking at plant cells, which will be partially a bit of a revision for you, uh, but we'll also be extending it a little as well. You should by now be familiar with terms such as organelle, the nucleus, DNA and membrane. Uh, but then again, um, you may not have done chemistry and biology for a little while, so this may also help you pinpoint some revision that you need to do before we go any deeper into plant physiology. Plant physiology is a great subject in that we start understanding how plants fit into the world, and particularly how they respond to the environment. And we're going to use this understanding to work out how they respond to things that we do to them. So be it in a paddock or in a vineyard, we'll see what particular triggers instigate cellular changes in the plants, how they respond on a cellular level to environmental changes. At the end of this lecture, I draw your attention to the readings that are available in Topic 1, and they've been chosen to highlight the fact that even this fundamental understanding of the contents of plant cells is important for understanding cutting-edge research in the industries that we're interested in, uh, interested in. So this knowledge of cellular contents can actually be applied to real industry requirements. And that's what it's all about. These slides that you're seeing here are taken and referenced from Tate's and Zyga, which is the prescribed text for this subject. So what, what is plant physiology? Well, plant physiology refers to the study of plant function. Plant botany refers, is the study of how plants are composed, what they look like, and how they differ from each other. Plant physiology actually looks and studies at how they operate. In particular, how do they interact with the abiotic environment, so physical environment like the wind, the cold, heat, uh, minerals, as well as how they interact with the living environment. So how do they communicate with each other? How do they communicate within themselves? So how does the root zone communicate to the canopy? How do they respond to insect attack? We'll be looking at processes such as the exchange of gases between the leaf and the surrounding environment, particularly how the leaf converts a gas in the form of carbon dioxide into a solid and how that is then transported around the plant. We look a great deal into water and plants, water relations. How does the plant transport water from the soil all the way up through the plant into the leaves where it uses it for photosynthesis and then water then is transported into the surrounding environment through the process of transpiration. We'll be honing in onto that process of photosynthesis and looking at it in quite uh, a lot of detail. We'll also be looking at the effect of key hormones involved in plant function, particularly abscisic acid. All these processes depend on the physical structure of the plant and plants differ in their physical composition quite drastically. We have some which live prostrate to the ground. They just they run along the ground and keep as low profile as possible. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Eucalyptus regnans, the mountain ash. We have Sequoia dendrons giganteans, which both grow to over 100 metres tall. How, for instance, do these 100 metre trees get water from the soil all the way up to their leaves? We'll be having a look at that, certainly in these early topics. Plants are a great thing to study because they're absolutely amazing in their diversity. As I said before, they range from the 
some of the smallest organisms up to some of the largest that we know of. And some of the most interesting conclusions that we've made in the last hundred years have been developed by looking at why certain plants which are closely related have evolved slightly different forms. What is actually causing them to produce different leaves, have different colour? Some drop their leaves coming into winter, others do not. Why does this happen? And what can this tell us about the world? Plants are important because they are the primary, the, the principal primary producers on earth and that they are the main converters of inorganic molecules like um, carbon dioxide into physical nutrients which the rest of the earth utilises. Plants are interesting because they're non-motile in that they are sessile objects. Therefore, they have to withstand whatever environment is they are subjected to. Likewise, they have to extract the resources from the limited environment for which they are able to reach. There's very, very few plants which are able to move, one of which is the mangrove, which, is, which over the, the course of its life gradually walks, for want of a better word, towards the ocean. All plants which produce seeds have the same basic body plan. We talk about insects in other subjects. All insects have the same body plan. They have a head, they have an abdomen, and they have a thorax. Plants, similarly, are divided between the leaf or the, the overall canopy of the plant, the stem, sometimes referred to as the trunk or the bowl, and the root or root zone. So the leaf, the stem, and the root. The primary functions of the leaf are for photosynthesis, providing energy, and allowing, uh, providing a means for exchange of water to the atmosphere, which allows transpiration to occur. The stem and root system are there for support. The root system is there for support and anchoring it, the plants in the physical environment, as well as allowing it to absorb water and minerals. Very little water, if any, is absorbed through anything other than the root zone. Likewise for minerals. Leaves attach themselves to a stem at what we call nodes. And the internode region, which is a term which gets used a lot, especially in viticulture, is that region between two nodes. Combining a stem and a leaf is referred to as a shoot. And here we have a schematic of a typical dicotyledonous plant. That is a plant which after germination develops two cotyledons or two um, original leaves. We see the root zone at the bottom. All dicots if they're grown from seed, develop a strong taproot for which lateral roots form from the taproot. We see a stem here and as we move up the stem, we see various nodes for which leaves are growing off. And at the very top, we have the merry stem where undifferentiated, undifferentiated tissue is formed. So cells developing from the merry stem at the top of the plant can go on to create any cell they want. They are the stem cells of plants. So we have our apical meristem at the top and we have our axillary buds, which are meristematic at the side of each node as well. So at the side of each node as well, we have the development of this undifferentiated tissue. At the apex of the root zone, we also have 
a mirror stem as well, and that's where the new root cells form. All plants are divided into the gymnosperms, which are the more primitive plants, of which there's very few. The classic gymnosperm is the pine tree. These are referred to as the non-flowering plants. Angiosperms, on the other hand, there's many, many, many species, over 250,000 known angiosperm species, and these are known as the flowering plants. And a majority of the plants which are native to Australia, for example, are angiosperms, whereas you see a lot more gymnosperms in the Northern Hemisphere. Vitis vinifera, the grapevine, is an angiosperm. Big difference between plants and cells is a number, uh, sorry, plants and animal cells, there's a great number of them. But the main one is that a plant cell is surrounded by a cell wall, composed largely of cellulose. The animal cells do not have a cell wall. Fungi, they have a cell wall as well. It's not composed of cellulose, but they also have a cell wall. No animal cells are surrounded by a cell wall. There's two types of cell walls. All cells have a primary cell wall. This is the thin tissue surrounding a cell which is laid down first. And then some cells go on mature and create a secondary cell wall which is thicker and stronger and contains the substance lignin. So in woody tissue, we see cells with this secondary cell wall. And this provides a lot of strength for the plants. To transport between the cells with these secondary cell walls, they produce things called pits, which are essentially transport tunnels between the cells. As I said before, the plant equivalent of stem cells are called uh, meristematic cells produced in the meristem, so these tissues um, at the tips of the shoots and the tips of the root, which can produce cells which can go on to create anything they want. And this is pretty much where all the mitosis occurs, so the replication of cells and division of cells. This can also occur, so it occurs at the tip of the shoot and the tip of the root, and it can also occur at the, the nodes, where I said before we get those axillary buds, which also have meristematic tissue. And then also in the center of the root, an area called the pericycle can also get meristematic activity. And this is the site where the lateral roots grow. And this is important for a plant because it means it can essentially grow lateral roots wherever it wants within the root zone, which means it can take advantage of water or nutrient availability anywhere within the root zone. On this next slide, we see a typical cross-section of a typical dicot. And I'd like you to have a good look in your textbook as well, where they do a great comparison between a dicotyledonous stem and root system compared to a monocotyledonous stem and root system. Have a look there uh, with the classic cross-section of a leaf, and that looks very much like a classic vitis vinifera leaf. We have the epidermal cells at the top, the skin cells or dermal tissue, forming a single layer of non-photosynthetic tissue. And this is the boundary between the inside of the plant and the external environment. Beneath that, we have these column or pillar-shaped cells called the palisade mesophyll or palisade parenchyma cells. Beneath these column or pillar-shaped palisade parenchyma or palisade mesophyll cells, we have the spongy mesophyll cells, also known as the spongy parenchyma cells. 
Going through the middle of the leaf, we have the conductive tissue, the phloem and xylem, which transports water and nutrients around the plant. So the, the xylem here in the middle of the leaf would be bringing water up from the root zone to the leaf cells. The phloem here would be taking sugars produced in the leaf and sending them around to the rest of the plant. At the bottom here, we see our friends the stomata, which are the openings between the inside of the leaf and the external environment. The plant makes sure it very tightly controls all gas exchange between its internal environment and external environment. And one of the larger, one of the main reasons it does this is to prevent too much loss of water. So it, it makes sure that most gas exchange takes place through these little doorways which it has control over their opening and closing. And we'll go through their composition and how they operate a bit later on. Let's look now down at the stem. The center or the outside, just like of the leaf, we have the epidermis or dermal tissue, the skin tissue of the stem. Inside that we have a small layer of cortex, which makes up um, essentially dead phloem cells. Within that we have the active conductive tissue, the xylem and the phloem, of which new tissue is put down every year. And that is what produces the rings that we see in plants, new xylem and phloem. Xylem is always laid down by the plant on the inside and phloem on the outside. So this cortex tissue would be representative of old phloem cells which were used in previous years by this plant. In the middle, we have pith, which is composed, um, of which partially composed of old xylem cells. Now we move down to the root, and the root is a fascinating structure. We'll be looking at the vertical structure of a root a bit later on, but here we have the horizontal or cross section of the root, we have the epidermis again on the outside. These little squiggles here are root hairs, which are emanating from the epidermal tissue. So root hairs actually are extensions of the epidermal cells. Inside this epidermal tissue, we have the cortex, again, which makes up the body, the main body of the root zone. This cortex is very important for storage of nutrients for the plant. Inside of this cortex, we have the endodermis, which is an impervious layer called the Casparian strip. We'll go through that in a moment. But the purpose of this impervious layer here is to prevent water going straight from the soil into the conductive tissue in the middle of the root zone. But we'll go through that again a bit later on. Just underneath the endodermis is the pericycle, which is that meristematic tissue, the stem cells of the plant again. And this is where those lateral roots form. So the roots, the lateral roots, which we see up on this main plant, form here in the pericycle, not to be confused with these root hairs, which are extensions of the epidermal tissue. Inside of the uh, pericycle, we have the conductive tissue within the root primarily taking water up, which has been absorbed by the root up to the canopy, and also where sugars and other carbohydrates formed in the leaves are being distributed around the root zone. Don't forget that the root zone is a growing and living beast as well, and so it requires energy formed through photosynthesis as well. So the phloem plays an important part in bringing this energy down from the canopy. So of the tissue in these plant organs, we have dermal tissue, which is that outer epidermal tissue, the skin, and we have the ground tissue, which makes up all the other cells within the plant. The first type of cell, which is laid down by the meristem, is the parenchyma cell. So the go-to cell for these meristems is the parenchyma cell. It's the workhorse cell. Parenchyma cells make up the bulk of the leaf, and this is where the photosynthesis takes place. We have the vascular tissue. And the vascular tissue 
is composed of some other um, and here's look at that there's a spelling mistake uh, from the slides before I go into the vascular tissue I'll just go through the other two ground tissue elements so we had our parenchyma which were those first cells which are created by this merry stem and these parenchyma cells can then get converted into some other types of cells first of all is the calenchyma cells um, these are long cells which are strengthened. Um, they've got a strengthened cell wall which allows them to maintain a higher internal pressure, which supplies strength and rigidity to green tissue. One step up from calenchyma cells is sclerenchyma cells. And these sclerenchyma cells actually have lignin laid down in their secondary cell walls, which gives them a woodiness. And it's these sclerenchyma cells which uh, become the fibres. Classic uh, example of sclerenchyma tissue is, are those long fibres that you can peel off uh, celery. All right, so there's three types of ground tissue, the parenchyma, calenchyma, and sclerenchyma. Sclerenchyma being the hardest tissue, which has a secondary cell wall. Um, partially composed of lignin. So that's the, the ground tissue which makes up the body of the plant. Then we have this conductive tissue which transports either water, being the xylem, or nutrients, being the phloem. In the dicots, we have two types of um, vascular tissue. We have the tracheids as well as the vessels. The tracheids are more a primitive version of conductive tissue. Uh, they make for a, a, a more slow and circuitous route for water up the plant with water going up and then going sideways through these pits into the next tracheid and then moving up and then going sideways. Whereas the vessels allow for much more linear transport of water. So these vessels by one on top of each other, which creates sort of like a straw running up the plant. The phloem has these sieve cells, which is similar in structure to, uh, in structure to the vessels. The, the phloem is interesting because they are, are accompanied by con companion cells on the outside, whereas the xylem cells are predominantly dead tissue the phloem cells have these living cells just off to the side, which allows exchange of uh, materials between the phloem and surrounding tissue. Now we'll look within these plant cells. We looked at the different types of cells. Now look, let's look inside the cells. We're gonna go through some of the organelles and other membrane bodies within the plant cells, which all play a function. Here's an overall picture of a plant cell, um, of which is also replicated in your textbook. First of all, let's remind ourselves about the importance of membranes. Membranes form a semi-permeable barrier for transport of solutes. So water can pass through these membranes, however, larger molecules Cannot, and this is this is how plant cells prevent things just going flicking in and out of their cells. It allows them to build up gradients of ions um, and protect themselves from dehydration and the like. These membranes are uh, created by the classic bilayer of phospholipids or glycosylated um, glycosyl glycerides. My mistake. Within these membranes, they're not just these lipid bilayers, but they also have transmembrane proteins as well as other lipids within them, which play various roles. The proteins generally play a role in allowing transport. They form these tunnels or channels from the inside to the outside of the plant cell, which allows particular larger molecules to either be excluded or transported in and out of the cell. And here we see 
some stylized versions or cross sections of the membrane, some of which include these transmembrane proteins. Now we'll look at the endomembrane system, the system within this cellular membrane. From we'll be looking going from the nucleus down to the plastids, which includes the chloroplast. The nucleus contains all the genetic material and is the sensible place to start in this discussion. Here we see some fantastic microscopy of the membrane. We have the nuclear envelope, which is the membrane surrounding the nucleus, keeping the genetic material in. We have the nucleolus in the middle, which is where the ribosomal RNA is formed. Ribosomal RNA going on to form the ribosomes, which are the protein factories. Chromatin is an important substance which helps package DNA. Every cell has meters upon meters of DNA within it, which has to get packaged up into a tight little bundle so it can fit in these ridiculously small nucleuses. Nuclei, sorry, nucleuses, nuclei. So think of the nucleus as Swedish or Scandinavian by design. Everything is fits perfectly. And it's this chromatin, these little, little um, charged balls, which which package up the DNA into these small little tight bundles. And here, figure 1.7, we see an example of the DNA. It's already in its double helix, but then the plant cell goes, well, that's not, that's not compact enough for me, so it gets these histones, which are part of the chromatid complex, and it winds the DNA around these histones and makes this very tight bundle called a chromatin fiber. Surrounding the nucleus is the endoplasmic reticulum. And the endoplasmic reticulum is there to not only support the synthesis of proteins, but also to package up things which are produced and transport them around the cell. We have rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is the endoplasmic reticulum which has ribosomes built within it, the protein factories, and we have smooth ER, or endoplasmic reticulum, which primary function is purely packaging. And the next couple of slides there, please take note of how some of this operates. Um, it's quite simple and it makes sense that the endoplasmic reticulum is found around the nucleus because it's the nucleus which is sending out the signals that tells the cell what proteins to produce. Some of the vesicles formed by the endoplasmic reticulum are sent to the Golgi apparatus, which then transports these vesicles to places they need to go. They either send them out of the cell or they send them to vacuoles or they may make them part of the membrane. It's the Golgi's like the uh, FedEx of the cell. And here we see in figure 1.12, the Golgi apparatus receiving these little bundles from the endoplasmic reticulum and then the Golgi apparatus sending them where they need to go. We see some going towards the vacuole for storage, other being sent towards the membrane where they'll be sent out of the cell. Parts of the membrane can be uh, endocytosed or, or recycled where the membrane goes back into a vesicle form. Often when the membrane or the cell itself is shrinking, the, you have all this extra membrane there because the actual site, there's less cytoplasm, so the membrane starts shrinking in on itself. It gets rid of this extra membrane by pinching it off, making vesicles, and then they can go off to get recycled, the constituents of those little vesicles. The vacuole is an often overlooked organelle within the, the cell. But it's very, very important for storage. Vacuoles can be used for storage of salt, 
in plant roots as a storage mechanism to prevent salt from getting to the canopy. Anthocyanins are stored in the vacuole of grapes. They can store fatty bodies in the vacuole for degradation or metabolism later on. Oil bodies are important, often found in seeds where actual fatty acids or oils, or lipids, are stored in little vesicles. Um, and then these are broken down as a high source of energy later on. And there's a reason why seeds are so good for you, like multigrain bread. There's other micro bodies like these oil bodies I was talking about before, which all are named after the different role that they play. Peroxisomes, for example, are there to break down or store and then break down fatty acids that are produced. The mitochondria is the power plant of the cell. So the chloroplast converts light energy into physical chemical bonds in the form of sugars which is a storage form of energy, but then that energy has to be utilized. And that is what the mitochondria does. It is the site of cellular respiration where sugars are metabolized into ATP, which is the little battery of the cell. It's the ATP which drives cellular function, any cellular function that requires energy. We have mitochondria just like plants have them. Often get confused with chloroplasts so don't forget the chloroplasts are there for photosynthesis the conversion of light energy into an energy store be in this case sugars the mitochondria is there to harness the energy found within these sugars and turn it into this atp atp being the molecule which is used to drive all energy requiring cellular functions the chloroplast, as I said before, is one of a group of organelles called the plastids. It's composed of a whole lot of a whole series of membranes, highly folded membranes, which are used to just like a battery in your car to build up charge. It's in the chloroplasts where the pigments are found, which harness light energy through the process of photosynthesis. There's a whole range of pigments, not just chlorophyll, the green one but also carotenoids, which are responsible for the yellow, orange, and red colors. Carotenoids are also incidentally broken down to create terpenoids, the flavor compounds in grapes. Chloroplasts and the mitochondria actually divide independently of the cells and they actually have their own DNA as well. And this tells us, or gives us a vital clue, that mitochondria and chloroplasts were actually originally bacteria back billions of years ago as these multicellular organisms were evolving for the first time. So chloroplasts were originally photosynthetic bacteria and mitochondria were originally heterotrophic bacteria. And they still retain the circular DNA that the bacteria had back then. What holds all these plants together stops the, the cell walls from sort of floating apart, the membrane from just expanding, expanding, expanding. Well, there's these anchors within the cells, these filaments. Some filaments called microtubules not only play a structural role, but help transport things within the cell. And then there's microfilaments, which are not hollow. These are solid ones, which are purely there for support. Scaffolding. Some of them play a very important role in mitosis and meiosis as well as cytokinesis, cell division. Um, and it's always a good point to go back over your mitosis and meiosis from living systems. So we've got our microfilaments which are there to support within the cell wall, but then how does how is there communication between cells? Well, one way that cells communicate with each other and molecules are transported between cells is via the plasmodesmata, which are uh, tubes which run from the endoplasmic reticulum of one cell to the endoplasmic reticulum to the other. So there's not just the cytoplasm of one sort of doing unregulated transport between one cell and the other, 
but it's sort of a moderated system guided by the endoplasmic reticulum. So that's the end of the slideshow for topic one, but don't forget to please read the uh, Tates and Zeigler references which accompany this slideshow. Plant physiology is a subject that requires a lot of extra reading. So please take this lecture as a starting point to go through those particular readings given for this. The subject doesn't go beyond any information in these slides, but make sure that each little point in these slides, you've just done that little bit of, of background reading on as well.